everybody here. Thanks so much for attending. Um, I have uh, a bunch of slides, but at the end of the slides, I will actually jump into a demo and actually uh, the code. Um, I normally I normally don't 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 show the code, but actually this is a development network, so I will do it. Uh, so let's start. Uh, my name is Edgar McGenna. I'm a principal engineer of Cisco, and I've been working for in uh, OpenStack since uh, 2011. I was part of the incision team uh, for this project called Neutron. So we're going to talk about that uh, in a little bit. Uh, so what I was expecting about this presentation is to have uh, some kind of planning. Maybe it's going to be different. So I will encourage you to make it this way. Uh, so I will encourage you to ask me questions about anything that I'm saying, anything that I'm not saying but it's actually related to OpenStack. Uh, what I don't want at the end is just an awkward silence. I would like to have uh, some QA at the end. Please, please, let's do it. Um, I would like to acknowledge that most of the stuff that I'm presenting here is, uh, is part of the open source, uh, OpenStack community. So you will find um, reference to a lot of this work in, um, in OpenStack.org. So uh, let's start with what is OpenStack. Um, and I don't know what happened. Sorry about that. My screen is OK. Okay, we're back. Sorry about that. Uh, so what is OpenStack? It's basically a cloud management system. It's actually uh, a pure software. It's all open source. It's all written in Python. It's, uh, it's uh, designed such a way that it's uh, isolating different uh, pillars. So OpenStack and, and the cloud is about management, uh, managing the resources, computational resources, networking, storage, etc. right? So we have these three pillars that we call uh, compute networking storage. Uh, each one of them, they have a, a project name. Uh, for compute, it's called Nova. For networking, it's called Neutron. For, uh, for storage, we have uh, we have Cinder. We have uh, a little bit more of mixing there. We have also Swift. We have other projects there. And we have a, a dashboard, a UI, to call all the APIs. Uh, what is important about all these APIs are uh, open. So actually, these projects, they talk uh, between each other through the APIs. We encourage uh, all the developers to actually use the APIs, not really using the um, RPC mechanisms or things like that. Um, so a little bit more about the projects is very, very, very easy. As I said before, we try to manage resources in such a way that through open APIs, uh, we can create uh, the cloud. Uh, so the compute part is basically provide all those APIs to create VMs, to move VMs, any kind of operation that you can think about uh, computational resources is through the Nova project. Now, we need, we need to find a way to actually connect all those virtual instances. Um, at the beginning, we have uh, some component of the compute part, it was called Nova Network, that is being replaced by a, a project about networking that is called Neutron. Uh, the one about uh, block storage is called Cinder. Uh, it's basically providing uh, persistent block storage for the VMs. Uh, so if you put all this together, you actually uh, will be uh, able to offer uh, infrastructure as a service. The last logo is because um, um, all those APIs is accessible through um, uh, UI, it's called Horizon, say before, and also uh, CL, CLI. So conceptually, it's very clean. It's very easy to understand what is OpenStack, right? You have in the top 
uh, the dashboard is a way to actually invoke or call all these APIs. At the bottom, you have a very important component of OpenStack. It's called the Identity Service, which is uh, the project name is called uh, uh, Keystone. As you can see, all these arrows are actually pointing always to the identity because all the APIs are certified through the identity um, a project. And then uh, these projects, they talk each other. But before they start talking between each other, they need to be authenticated as well. So not just users are uh, authenticated with the identity system that actually support some backend system like LDAP and things like that. Actually, the services, when they uh, interact between each other, they also talk to the identity service as well. So uh, this one is very conceptually, very clean. As I said before, each one of these is an isolated project. And actually, some of them can just work by themselves. They don't need to interact between each other. So how is it going to look if I show you logically the interaction? So it becomes a little bit more messy. Why? Because each one of these projects is intended to actually have mechanisms to support functionality by itself. So uh, we used to have some components, as I said before, in Nova, like the Nova network, the Nova volume. Actually, these two uh, were replaced by the, by the Cinder project, by the uh, Neutron project. But before that, they actually were by themselves. And as you can see, each one of these uh, building blocks, they have their own database. So they actually uh, don't share that uh, storage system. They cool uh, by different projects, but I, they, they work by themselves. With this, each one of these projects could actually interact uh, with other entities. So let's say, uh, for any reason I don't like the Cinder functionality and I want to replace with my own. So that's a way to do it, just invoking the APIs. It's very flexible. Um, some of the projects, uh, specifically the Neutron one, and I will deeply talk about that, they have a mechanism to invoke uh, specific drivers for vendors. Uh, so as I said before, all OpenStack is uh, open source. And because of that, we cannot put vendor-specific code there. But we have uh, a framework that actually you can extend it to talk to your, your specific uh, uh, provider. So let's, let's talk about Neutron. Uh, as I said before, it was an incubation project in April 2011. For uh, the people who are not very familiar with OpenStack, we have uh, a release cycle every six months. So we, uh, we just recently came back from the Design Summit in Atlanta. It was the ninth uh, one. So uh, right after we released the software, or the new version of the software, all the developers come together in this summit, and uh, we start discussing the next cycle release, the future, how it's going to be the development process, the review process, uh, all the blueprints that will be actually implemented on that process. So uh, it's also an opportunity for new projects that want to be on their umbrella of, of OpenStack to be uh, started as an incubation. So Newton started in, in April 2011 in Santa Clara, actually. It was promoted to core project in, uh, one year later uh, in the Falso Summit. And, um, and the idea actually to have a Neutron uh, back in that time was basically to solve two basic problems. With uh, the compute power, they had to have a mechanism to connect VMs, Nova Network, and it was very basic. Um, the only isolation mechanism that you can offer was by, uh, using VLANs back in that time. So it was not scalable. Another problem is, uh, was that actually all the uh, networking operations were, uh, were on by the cloud operator, which means tenant couldn't actually create their own network topologies. One of the power that we want to bring uh, to OpenStack is to the tenants by themselves to create any kind of network uh, topologies, complex network topologies, and start creating not just switching functionality, routing functionality, and then extend it to advanced services, so layer four to layer seven services, such as uh, firewall, load balancing, etc. So because of these two uh, limitation on our network, we created Neutron. So uh, what is Neutron? It's a network as a service, part of the OpenStack, it's uh, exactly as the other projects provide uh, REST APIs to manage all the network connections. Uh, all the networking resources are actually part of, uh, of the Neutron code. It's uh, technology agnostic, so we don't have any uh, specific vendor uh, component there. 
But we have a framework where you can, uh, through the plugins, connect your own specific technology. Um, it provides a, a better way to provide uh, isolation of a tenant's network, not just through VLANs. You can actually create uh, uh, overlay networks with GRE tunnels or VXLAN tunnels. Uh, it's a modular design, so each one of these components will talk through uh, APIs and also RPC mechanisms that uh, we will explain a little bit more. A standalone service, it can just work by itself, and uh, part of the demo will show how we can actually uh, uh, isolate some communication of, uh, of the neutron part. And um, it's a very cool place to actually start learning how the SDN uh, evolution is, is, is getting involved in OpenStack. Let's try to use the micro because otherwise nobody will hear the question. Thanks so much. And thank you for asking questions. Okay. Is there an advantage to using Neutron as a standalone service rather than incorporating it all as an open stack? It wasn't designed to actually just be isolated. So I would say there's no advantage. It was designed to actually uh, fixing these two problems, the, the problems that I mentioned before. But it can work by itself. Uh, what I mean with that, uh, uh, you don't have a controller yet, and you want a mechanism to just uh, to work to, to talk to your controller with easy uh, APIs. Uh, that could be a that could be a good way. So, what are the neutron uh, features? Uh, it gives you compl uh, complete control over the following resources network, ports, and subnets. So we're going to start talking about APIs. Yes, the APIs are going to be invoking these three simple resources. So you will be able to create, create, delay, update networks, as well as ports, as well as subnets. This is what we call in Neutron the core APIs. Now, we have extended APIs. We are, um, such of them are uh, routing functionality, so you can create a router, uh, the advanced services, you can create a load balancer, you can create a firewall, Etc. And you can also extend uh, your vendor specific functionality. Let's say that you want to create a, a, a specific ACL configuration for a Nexus switch. Well, that's not part of the core API, but it's part of the extended API, so you can actually do it. And the framework provides the mechanism to extend even more those APIs. So you can actually start creating real complex topologies that will be owned by your tenants. Uh, it actually has their own segmentation process. So when we are uh, implementing like VLANs, it actually has um, VLAN configuration all the way from the virtual layer to the physical layer. And you can actually uh, uh, configure uh, multiple devices at the same time. It's not designed to uh, be the replacement of any uh, network controller. It's actually a proxy layer for uh, network controllers, like Open the Light, for instance. Um, it was designed to talk to one plugin at a time. Why? Because uh, we, di we didn't want to have a mix of uh, network functionality by different vendors to be uh, mixing in, in Neutron. So we say like, we have multiple plugins, but you will be able to use one at a time. Later, we find out that that was uh, a limitation. So we say, actually, we want to create uh, topologies that we will involve more than one specific back backend technology. Uh, just to give you an example, we find out that maybe you want to use an open source virtual switch like OBS, and you want to use uh, a physical switch uh, like the Nexus family, uh, so we wanted to have um, a mechanism to involve more than one plugin. Uh, so we created what we call the ML2, Modular Layer 2 um, plugin. So some of the plugins, they were converted into drivers, and those drivers will be invoked by this ML2. So for instance, the Cisco uh, plugin support uh, Nexus 1KB, NXOS, OBS. We can actually, uh, uh, we have a lot of work in progress with other uh, Cisco components the Cisco CSR uh, B. We currently have a service, a VPN as a service, and we actually have a driver for uh, the Cisco uh, CSR B implemented it. Uh, there was another, another version of uh, 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 multi-plugins. It was called the Meta plugin. Yes, please, use the mic, thank you. So is that multiple plugin support available now? Like, what's the status of that? The ML2, yes, it's, it's, it's totally available. It's actually the default plugin when you um, 
download uh, OpenStack, and we will go through that. The default plugin enabled is actually ML2 with OBS. Um, so actually, Neutron was really, really focused on what we call the virtual network infrastructure. What I mean with that is just the uh, network connectivity between virtual entities, virtual machines. Later, we found out that we actually wanted to extend it to the physical layer uh, uh, to interconnect different hosts, right? So this is where we create the, uh, uh, to create VLAN configuration, overlay configuration at the switch level, um, and beyond. We have uh, uh, partners that actually wanted to extend it all the way, all the way to one uh, configurations to have uh, different cloud data centers connected. So what are the uh, most known neutral limitations? It doesn't do any network uh, 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 physical infrastructure. It doesn't discover the, uh, the physical infrastructure. It has to be injected such a way. However, the framework is extendable to be connected to uh, uh, any, any network and monitoring system or discovery system that you have available uh, to fit uh, the plugin's information with that um, uh, resource uh, discovery. It doesn't have any synchronous, uh, synchronization mechanism with other network management systems. So unfortunately, you're already current, uh, currently using a network management system, and uh, you want to have a synchronization mechanism with Neutron, that, that is not possible. And by design, we didn't want to do it because that will be very, very uh, vendor specific. So we wanted to have um, Neutron, and actually it's part of the open stack, open source des uh, designs, Everything has to be open source. Any single feature that we put upstream is open source. So, um, however, the plugins can delegate this work. So, a, you can actually have um, an open daylight -like plugin that will make uh, some synchronization mechanism or with the uh, flow light -like controller, etc. And um, at the beginning, we didn't want to go beyond the access layer. Uh, so by design, we wanted to limit it just to go to the access of the racks. Uh, however, uh, this is changing, and the latest summit we decided that actually it will make sense to go beyond that point. So some of the plugins actually does configuration beyond that point. Some of them they don't even do configuration at the virtual layer; they just do configuration at the physical layers. So that's uh, that. Th this is the architecture. Uh, I like a lot this slide because it's going to give you a better, a better understanding of how is the neutron um, uh, uh, architecture uh, uh, working. So on the top of the layer, we have the API. That is where all the REST calls are getting in. Uh, it defines these core operations that I mentioned before for network subnets and ports. It has some extensions. Uh, some of the most popular extensions is uh, the routing one. So you can create routers. One, uh, one that is very popular is port binding. Port binding, it's a, it's a mechanism that actually you can connect, you can create a port, and you bind it to a specific uh, uh, virtual technology, right? So you can connect it to OBS uh, drivers, you can connect it to basic Linux driver, or something else, Nexus uh, 1KB drivers, etc. So that port binding is very essential because when you create the virtual port, needs to be aware of which kind of technology, backend technology, will be supported. And there are more. Uh, uh, there are some uh, from Cisco about queues, so you can uh, provide a specific queues uh, uh, value, and the configuration of the network will follow um, uh, DSCP values uh, that is going to match this this abstraction. Now we have, uh, after the la API layer, we have the, net, uh, the service layer. This is, what, this is like the heart of Neutron. This is where all the persistent information is happening, communication with the database. Um, we also have um, um, a check layer here. Let's say that you're creating uh, a couple of networks that the siders will conflict. This is the layer where all this validation is happening. So uh, we do support, or Neutron does support uh, overlapping of IPs. Different tenants will have uh, the same CIDR configuration, but if you have one tenant is creating two networks uh, with the same CIDR, that doesn't really make sense, right? Especially you want to connect those networks, so that will be a problem, that will be a conflict. So this layer actually uh, advertised that that is a problem there. 
And now we have the delegation uh, layer to the plugin. This is the, the layer where you actually select the plugin that you wanna you wanna use. By configuration, that happens when you start Neutron, and then all the calls are delegated to this uh, to this uh, layer. Now you have the specific plugin implementation. It will depend on what kind of technology you have, and that technology could, uh, or vendor specific will expand their own extensions. So uh, what kind of extensions we have? Uh, as I said before, we have the course for uh, Nexus One KV, and, and you can actually create your own extension, you will, your own vendor specific. So the framework is very, very flexible. Um, parallel to this uh, plugin implementation, we have the services. The services act like other plugins that you can create at the same time. So we have currently three services, BPM, Firewall, and Low Balance as a Service. And then at the, at the bottom of this architecture, you have actually the BNI and the PNI, the virtual network infrastructure and the physical network infrastructure, actually when the enforcement, enforcement points of, uh, of Neutron. Talking about uh, plugins, so uh, it was in Havana, which is uh, one year old now, the uh, modular layer two plugins. We have, uh, we used to have before that a plugin for Linux bridge configuration and OpenV switch configuration. Why we're using these ones? Because these are the open source tools that we have available. However, they've been deprecated and, and very soon the code will be removed uh, from upstream. Now we have um, obviously the Cisco plugin and there are a bunch of other plugins. I think the last time that I saw the code there were around uh, 13 or 14 different vendor specific plugins. And then we have the drivers. The drivers, for instance, Firewall. So VRMO has uh, a specific uh, driver for their own uh, technology. So here you are. Uh, the Low Balance as a Service has a basic HA uh, proxy support. The VPN um, as a Service has uh, IPsec support, uh, single to site configuration, uh, single site to multi site configuration. And Firewall as a Service is basically a IP tables configuration. Again, everything has to be open source, so we don't have any vendor specific on each one of them. So these are the services that talk about the plugins. So now let's, let's, let's gonna talk about how really a VM gets connected to a network, a virtual network, right? Um, so these two components, uh, the compute part and the networking part, Nova and Network, they talk a lot. This is a very uh, common process, right? Because actually the compute part is the one that actually will select the host server where the VM will be created and started. So it needs to tell Neutron where the port has to be created. So the one that actually creates the port is the VM instantiation process. So you, uh, Nova will boot a VM, it will create the tap interface on that host device, mm -hmm. and then the neutron service will create that port, and now it's gonna allocate an IP address uh, from the subnet that it was assigned to that specific network. So there are a bunch of operations that is gonna happen uh, because we do support uh, DHCP operation through uh, namespaces. So Neutron will create an space where a DHCP uh, process is gonna be running through DNS mask. So that process will get a call to say, you will need to allocate an IP address for this specific uh, uh, port. So basically, uh, port MAC. So basically all the, all, the, all the IP allocation, even that is through a DNS mask process, is actually static IP allocation. Because uh, we need to know in advance the IP, uh, the IP address for that specific MAC, for that specific VM. Why we need to do that? Um, we have the concept of floating IPs, or the people who is familiar with Amazon, elastic IPs. So you can have uh, um, an external IP that you can uh, connect to your, uh, to your VM. So in order to do that, you need to actually have a NAT process to, uh, to NAT between a public IP and a private IP. So this is what we need to know in advance uh, to do the SNAT configuration, what is the IP address. So um, this is very simple when you read it this way. Unfortunately, things uh, are a little bit more complicated on the host. So the, the, yellow, the yellow box is actually a compute host. The green boxes at the top are VMs. 
they have a, a virtual interface. And then uh, let's say that we configure Neutron to do VLAN, uh, VLAN configuration. So in this case, we have two different uh, networks. One is running with VLAN 101, and the other one is uh, VLAN uh, 102. So we want to find out what is happening from the VM all the way to the physical interface of the host node. So there are a bunch of uh, uh, hops in the middle of the way, and I want to explain you why. So we could basically just connect. The Bnet is actually the tab device, which is being created when the VM is created as well. We can actually just wire that tap interface directly to the, in this case, OBS uh, bridge. And that will give us connectivity all the way up. Unfortunately, um, it will not give us another uh, functionality, which is security groups. Security groups, as you may know, is, uh, is a mechanism, uh, mechanism through IP tables to block communication between, network, uh, between VMs belonging to the same networks. Um, that was a very important feature that we have um, in, in, the, in the compute part, and we want to bring it in Netron as well. In order to do that, we have to create these uh, bed pairs, the orange boxes here at the top. Um, I think there's some pointer here, but anyway. Um, in these bed pairs, actually, uh, where we can create the IP, uh, IP tables configuration. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to create uh, um, a, this layer three domain to do uh, some, some configuration. We can also do here the NAT uh, for the floating IPs uh, configuration. However, it's, it's, it's gonna happen in a different host that we call the network node. Then we need to have a mapping between the VLAN tags that the OBS will support and the uh, VLAN tag that your physical infrastructure will support, right? So uh, by the file OBS would we'll give you uh, through the flows, uh, attack one, two, three, et cetera. So you need to convert uh, to map uh, that bill and um, ID from the OBS to the build, uh, to the virtual, um, uh, the VLAN that the physical infrastructure will support. So this is why we need to create another bit pair here to do the mapping between the, uh, these two VLANs IDs. So um, when we use uh, overlay networks, it gets simplified. You don't need that less uh, block. You connect directly the, to the virtual, uh, to the OBS that we call uh, BR-INT uh, from integration. And the combination uh, will go all the way uh, to the physical layer through overlay, as long as your physical uh, device understands either GRE tunnels or VXLAN tunnels. These are the, the two mechanisms supported uh, right now. Now, uh, The network uh, node, is the way we call it, is where actually uh, the layer three operations are happening, as well as the DNS, uh, DHCP operations happening, right? In order to provide isolation between tenants and in order to provide overlapping IPs, we created uh, namespaces where these processes are running and actually don't mix between each other. So you will have multi-tenancy, uh, multi uh, with the same IP address in the same host, and that's the way it happens. So the dotted red line shows a, a namespace where a DNS mass process is running, connected to the TAP interface with the same tag ID that the VLANs that you created before, or the networks that you, you created before, will be connected. And it follows exactly the same process that we had before. Um, it also have in the middle the, the what we call in, in Neutron the L3 agent. The L3 agent does the IP tables configuration for its NAT uh, uh, to provide the floating IPs. Uh, it's also uh, creating the routers to do IP forwarding. The way you do it with open source is just, uh, again, modifying the IP tables in this specific name space. So uh, these are two uh, very basic uh, um, um, uh, functionality but actually has a lot of power. When you extended any of these uh, type dev tab devices through multiple uh, compute um, hosts, they will, be in, they will enable the communication and um, you can either route it directly to this network node or you can directly uh, communicate between the compute nodes. Uh, both uh, models are supported. One of, the, uh, one of the limitations that Neutron has right now is uh, 
this is a single uh, single point of failure, right? Because if your layer tree ion is down, your routing functionality will not be enabled anymore. Your floating IP configuration will be uh, disabled, will not be working. So it is a major problem in Neutron. There are different ways to actually provide uh, HA support for this component. Uh, the most popular or the current one is uh, using an active admin mechanism to have a synchronization between two network nodes running the same processes, uh, uh, having mechanisms to synchronize between each other. However, there are so many, um, uh, there's a downtime, even that is active active, there is some synchronization that needs to happen between the databases. So people is looking into different mechanisms. So there is a new one that is called uh, DBR, distributed bit of router, which actually uh, every single compute node can actually be also a routing node. So you don't lose communica uh, communication between all the, all, the, um, all the VMs. You may lose communication if the compute node with that DBR is running, but obviously, if you lose that host, naturally you will lose the communication to the VMs hosted in that in that compute node. So that's that's uh, that is happening right now, and we're expecting to have that future release in uh, three months. So the new release uh, is gonna is, is is being called Juno, and um, it has to be released. So it's gonna be released on uh, October time frame this year. So with this. Uh, I want to talk about the neutron use cases. Uh, as I say, it's very, very important for the cloud operators to have the ability to overlap um, IPs. So I just put, uh, I just have this um, API call, and I would, like, I, I would like to drive you through the uh, functionality. So you basically first create a network. It just, uh, it will create a uh, GUID for the compute part to be aware of. Then you need to associate a, a subnet to that network, and the association is uh, also uh, defining the CIDR for that specific subnet. So we have here uh, 10.0.0.0 slash 24. Then once you have the network, once you have the subnet, you can start creating VMs. So we can have a couple of VMs associated to this uh, network. So you may have multiple networks. So through the API, you can actually define uh, to which network you want you want to create it. If you just have one network, uh, you don't need to specify that part. It will take it by default. If you have multiple networks, if you don't specify, it will take uh, the first one it was created by the cloud operator. Um, so now you're logging up, logging in back as a different tenant, and you follow exactly the same uh, steps, the same CIDR, and you can have everything running in only one compute node, and everything is going to work. Uh, you can assign exactly the same um, uh, CIDR, the, creating the same flavor VMs. Uh, flavor means just uh, a way to actually abstract the amount of computational resources that you will provide to create a VM. How many CPUs, how many memory, hard disks, etc. And then the process to clean it up. So this is a very common use case. Uh, it's one of the first things that I encourage people where there are going to be operators to start testing. The next one is the pu pu uh, public network. And actually, there is a sub uh, use case of this one that is called uh, provider networks. So the public network is you want to create, uh, you have a private network, and you want to connect it to a public network, right? The way to do it is uh, through these processes. And we have the concept of uh, provider network. A provider network is very, very nice concept that we have. It's actually an extension of the API. And basically what happened is you have already some resources running on your data center and you're creating new VMs. And you want these new VMs to be connected to those uh, uh, services running in your data center, right? Maybe you have a VLAN 2000, 2013 just to connect to a backend storage system and you want your VMs to connect it to that one. So through the provider network you actually can uh, provide the configuration uh, for that specific network to be running on that VLAN. 2013, it will be configured all the way up. So it will be connected to the same switch that you have that uh, VLAN 2013, and you will be able to connect to the backend the storage system, databases, anything that you already have, or you may have already running in your data center. 
Um, floating IPs, I mean, we need to find a way to connect to our VMs, right? Uh, cloud operators, they use OpenStack to uh, uh, most, one of the most uh, uh, popular use cases is uh, development. They can actually uh, uh, increase the time in productivity for their own developers. So they don't need to request a new host machine, connect it to the network, having a VLAN, and etc. You just create a VM, assign it to that specific uh, developer, that specific employee, and um, all the automation, all the orchestration is already, already there. Now, um, as you can see, these APIs are very specific for networking people, right? If I'm writing an API, if I'm writing an application, I want to use a different level of abstraction for the APIs, right? Because I don't know what is a network, I don't know what is a subnet. I'm an application uh, developer, and I just want to have a multi-tier uh, topology to test this application because one is going to be for my web server, for my application, and for my database. So this is this is too much for me. So in Neutron, we're creating a new abstraction on the top of these APIs, uh, and it's called the Policy Group Abstraction. So what we're going to do with this is to provide a set of APIs that application developers understand. Uh, through flavors, through different mechanisms, and actually will instantiate not network, not just networks and subnets. It will create firewall services, low balancer services, etc. There is also another project in OpenStack is called HIT. HIT is a project that actually create templates of the networks, so you can easily say uh, all these group of developers they normally have the same topology. So I can create in advance a template storage in heat and just call that template that it's going to have all the network configuration for all me uh, for all my developers so I, I don't need to go through all these i just go through that heat template and run it so heat is already available uh, the policy group is in development uh, we're expecting to have the first version uh, for the next release in in october so with this i would like to give you some pointers why some pointers? Because part of my work is also to make the OpenStack community to grow. I like to have more developers involved. Uh, as I say, it's open source. We have a bunch of documentation that it will help you to become an OpenStack developer. And not just for the Neutron project, for any other project. There are new projects. Actually, last time that I checked, we have around 23, 24 different projects in OpenStack. So we have the security system, the, the orchestration systems, uh, uh, the documentation part, etc. So there are a bunch of projects that are welcoming new developers. Uh, you can easily start with uh, bug fixing. Uh, you can easily start with small features and then start getting some more traction. If you're, specific, if you're a good Python developer, you are most welcome to, to come to the community. Uh, we have some rules. Uh, all the code is uh, openly exposed, a review. So if you don't want to develop, but you want to get involved, you can start uh, reviewing code. You can evaluate uh, other people's code and say, uh, 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 provide a feedback to the developer directly. Or you can just read the feedback that other developers are giving just to increase your own uh, programming skills. Uh, we are losing, uh, we, we, we're using Launchpad to track all the blueprints and also all the bugs. Jared is uh, to do the uh, integration, to do the development. We have an OpenStack, something that is uh, the continuous integration. That is very, very cool. Um, every time that a, a new commit is, is, uh, is pushed upstream, uh, there are different phases. Uh, the first phase is the checking gate. So uh, it will start a new sensation of all OpenStack with your specific piece of code. It will run a set of tests, and those tests are huge. Uh, but it's uh, just to guarantee the quality of the code and the functionality of the code. You will have a feedback for the system to say, yes, your code is good. Uh, it can be merged as long as the core reviewers approve it, or it needs to be fixed. We have also a PEP8 enforcement. Uh, for uh, semantic and sy uh, syntax. Uh, we have also some Python hacking rules. Uh, all those are available in, um, in GitHub. So with that, uh, I would like to run a demo.
And if in the meantime you have some questions, just feel free to. So I have everything actually running on my on my laptop. So we have this project is uh, one of those 24 projects in, in, in OpenStack that is the DevStack. DevStack basically uh, is a huge, very well structured batch script to pull all this open source code on OpenStack, create the configuration files, uh, apply the, the drivers that you want to use, and have a full operational OpenStack system in one VM. And this is what I'm running right now. And the host is down. Edgar, I have uh, two questions. Sure. Um, is is uh, RDO, I see the, the sticker on your, your laptop, is RDO uh, a sort of Red Hat specific flavor of uh, DevStack? That's actually a good question. Um, what is RDO? RDO uh, is a OpenStack distribution by uh, a sponsor by Red Hat. It's, uh, it's open, it's uh, free. Um, it's using something that is called Foreman, which Foreman is just uh, an abstraction uh, system to manage Puppet modules. So if you're familiar with Puppet modules, it's a way to orchestrate or uh, uh, automate uh, installation of different process. So uh, it's one of the most popular uh, OpenStack distributions out there. And uh, does Cisco have something like that that might incorporate automatically uh, the, the for instance, the Nexus 1000V or other plugins for Neutron. So Cisco doesn't provide an official distribution of OpenStack. However, we have something that we call COI, which stands for Cisco OpenStack Installer. It's also using Puppet. Uh, at Cisco, the OpenStack at Cisco team, we like to uh, be very friendly with the open source community. So every single uh, piece of code that we actually change, uh, not just in OpenStack projects, also on the Puppet modules, we like to push it upstream. So we keep as close as what we call the trunk, right? The main strip of uh, the, the, all the projects. So um, with the COI installer, you can actually uh, connect to the, obviously, Nexus 1KB, to the Nexus uh, 3K, 5K, and 7K, and have the, the uh, data center using UCS and, and Nexus switches uh, together. So is that publicly available? It is. It is. It's uh, it's it's free. You don't need to pay. It's um, in the website. You can just uh, uh, go to the Cisco.com. Go for look for OpenStack at Cisco, and there will be all the links to actually have uh, 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 the COI um, for you. Let's see if I can get my VM back. You know, I will do it here. So I said before, there are a lot of components that need to be working together. So I don't want you to understand what's going on here. I want you to focus on the bottom part. So as I say, a lot of processes, right? Uh, so let's start from the first one. So this is the Keystone uh, processes. You will see in this screen all the logs for the Keystone. You have uh, the UI, Horizon, uh, Glance, the API, the Neutron one, the Quantum, uh, uh, the service part. Uh, Neutron used to be called Quantum. Uh, so there's still some legacy there. Uh, you have the DHCP process, you have the VPN process. Uh, we have something that we call the metadata service. Uh, the LBAS process, the NOVA, the compute part, the scheduler, etc. There are a bunch of processes. And um, as a developer, you have this wonderful tool to actually see what is happening in each one of them. 
Uh, one of the things that uh, I like to show when I talk about Neutron um, and welcoming new developers is uh, it's very easy to start uh, learning and working on this. So I'm going to jump to the quantum server part here. And I will just stop the process. I will jump to my, I like Eclipse, you can just whatever you want. Uh, let's increase the font here. Okay, I will change it later. Uh, view, what is it, view? Uh, anyway. So what I want to do here is actually, I'm going to start the Neutron servers, uh, the Neutron service from the uh, from from Eclipse directly. So now I have control. I can create uh, breakpoints. So I already have one uh, breakpoint when I create a network. So what I'm going to do is uh, to log in as a log in a specific tenant. So there is a tenant already created that is called demo. Uh, so we can start calling the APIs. And Uh, when I lose connectivity, I lose the whole thing. So I will need to run it again. Sorry about that. So I will let this run in the back end. But before that, uh, we just have 10 more, uh, 10 more minutes. So I would like to know if there are more questions. No more questions? OK. So this is actually a very good example. So uh, when you get the dev stack, uh, you can get it from GitHub. You can just Google a dev stack, open a stack, uh, get the code, and simply run a stack SH, as I say, set a script. And we'll actually start pulling all the libraries that you need all the repos that you need, all the configuration files. Uh, as you can see, there were around 26 or 27 different processes. So this normally takes uh, some time, especially the very first time, because it's downloading a lot of things. I'm actually running in, in what we call offline mode. So it should be a little bit uh, uh, faster. Um, it creates all the, all the uh, services, all the database configuration, populates all the tables, etc. So it's very easy to get engaged. Um, I want to let it run in the back end. So um, this is what I have for today. I still want to know if there are some um, questions, comments, feedback, etc. OK. So we have time. So let's wait a little bit more. So you can see it's very descriptive. Uh, it tells you exactly now it's running Glance. Uh, what is the API that it's actually calling? What is the results? What is happening? Uh, it's uploading some new uh, images. There is one uh, uh, a Fedora-based image. There is a, a very basic Linux-based uh, image that is called Zeros. Um, it tells you how many connection is happening. Um, now it's starting the compute part. So it's very descriptive. So you just want to play a little bit with OpenStack. That's the best way to get familiar with. Obviously, DevStack is not intended to be running in production or something like that. This is why we have the distributions. Uh, and there are also uh, an alternative to that uh, that is called, uh, there are certain uh, well-baked products. So we have a bunch of companies that they just don't want to release a distribution. They want to provide a, uh, the whole product, right, just in the, the open source code. Uh, so we have companies like Piston Cloud, Meta, Meta Cloud, uh, Cloud Scaling, um, and others that actually provide you a full product. There are others that actually put it in a, a piece of hardware and give it to you. 
uh, the cases like Nebula, another company that it was uh, it was created as a part of the uh, OpenStack evolution. So they actually give you a whole uh, appliance that is running all these in, in produ production ready. So now it's, it's going to create all the certificates. Uh, Again, all the communication is, uh, is trusted between the services, so they need to be certificates created between all these components. And uh, it's gonna be make sure that all the, all the services have been created. If you wanna monitor what is happening. So you can create another. You can create another terminal and start uh, seeing all the all the services being created. And if there's some problem, it will it will show up there. And obviously, it's a lot of a lot of things running on just one VM, so it takes some time. So this is what I have. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, are there any other questions that you want to take offline? I'm just gonna be hanging around. Okay. Thank you, guys.